Pray with me. Father, right now we are going to go into a book that is a one of a kind. Lord, it is a book you wrote. Uh, it is the only book you've written. Lord, it is a book that not only we read it, but it reads us. God, it's the only book in history that is without error, without contradiction. Lord, I thank you for your word that is so perfect and so precise. Lord, now as we study your word, we recognize that, Lord, the very author of it is the only one who can decipher it for us. So, Lord, right now, not only as we study your word, am I asking that you'd help open our minds, but, Lord, open our hearts. And as we read it, Lord, teach us. As we receive the preaching of the word, Lord, let me say what the word says, and, Lord, let me not say what it doesn't say. Let me, all, let me do it all by the power of the Holy Spirit, and Lord, let us receive it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as we look into this beautiful, beautiful concept of the bodily resurrection and our resurrection one day that we have to look forward to, Lord, help us to see how that affects our living right now on this earth. For Lord, we ask it in the mighty, the matchless, the precious, the majestic name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just recently, as I was listening to a message on the resurrection by a, one of my favorite preachers, he shared this quote from another old-time preacher. It reads this way. There is a preacher of the old school, but he speaks as boldly as ever. He is not popular, though the world is his parish, And he travels every part of the globe and speaks in every language. He visits the poor, calls upon the rich, preaches to people of every religion and no religion, and the subject of his sermon is always the same. He is an eloquent preacher, often stirring feelings which no other preacher could and bringing tears to eyes that never weep. His arguments none are able to refute. Nor is there any heart that he has remained, that has remained unmoved by the force of his appeals. He shatters life with his message. Most people hate him. Everyone fears him. The name of that preacher, you ask, his name is death. Every tombstone is his pulpit. Every newspaper prints his text. And someday, every one of us will be his sermon. Tombstones do not often offer much hope. When I pastored in an Elam church in Long County some years ago, we had a, we had a cemetery out behind the church. And we lived in a parsonage next door, and it was an old, old cemetery And this may sound a little morbid to some, but but we used to walk through and just look at some of those 100, 150 year old tombstones. And I I remember one plot in particular with with a mother and a father and five small headstones of babies that had died maybe a year or two apart. None had lived more than a few days. And we often thought about this was 100 years ago. And we we would talk about and think about those, those parents and the grief they went through from those tombstones, and and we'd look at other headstones, and quite frankly, when you walk through a cemetery, not often do you think of hope, or joy, or excitement, or happiness, but we have something as Christians that defies the tombstone. We have something as Christians that overcomes The tombstone pulpit, it is a sermon preached louder than the tombstone. It is the sermon of the resurrection. The bodily resurrection of the saints is a magnificent thought for the future. And we oftentimes, I think, think of the resurrection as something that impacts us only for the future. But could I suggest to you today that the idea, the doctrine of the bodily resurrection of the saints is not only a great thought for the future, but it is a powerful tool that impacts how we live today. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to the book of 
1 Corinthians chapter 15 as we have one final message to finish the longest chapter in 1 Corinthians and it is called this message, The Resurrection Life. The Resurrection Life. As we are coming near to the end, a few more messages completing our series through 1 Corinthians called Dysfunction to Function. It is a series that we have now been in for about a year and a half, but we've taken some breaks here and there for certain holidays. And here recently, we've had a number of messages that have come along that we've we've moved in and out of. But 1 Corinthians 15 is a chapter, uh, kind of a mini-series within the series. We've done this a number of times. We had a a mini-series of messages back on divorce and remarriage and singleness uh, back earlier in, in 1 Corinthians. We had kind of a mini-series on spiritual gifts, just preaching through 1 Corinthians. And now we have had about five or six messages out of 1 Corinthians 15 on the bodily resurrection. It is no mistake, it is no uh, coincidence that the theme of resurrection coincides with the longest chapter of 1 Corinthians. It is an incredibly important topic, and it is for us today. So far, 1 Corinthians 15 has covered the evidence for Christ's resurrection in verses 1 through 11. It has covered the implications of denying the bodily resurrection, verses 12 through 19. The plan for resurrection, verses 20 through 28. The incentive for resurrection in 29 through 34. And a description and explanation of our resurrection bodies, 35 through 49, which Brother Tim Millwood shared a couple of weeks ago, did a great job describing to us out of the text of Scripture what our bodies will be like one day. In fact, I would dare say, regarding the bodily resurrection, that may be one of the most often thought of and discussed and asked questions, and that is, what will these bodies be like? And we learn that, thankfully, the body I'm in now really has very little uh, implication on what my body will be one day. Walk through the halls of a hospital, and I'll tell you this, you'll be glad that these bodies have very little impact on what our new bodies will be one day. Twist your ankle, get a stomach virus, break an arm, get hit in the head, get hurt, get injured, get, have surgery, and you'll be glad that these bodies have very, real, very little reflection on what our resurrection bodies will be one day. They are an entirely different entity, and we are glad for that. But the resurrection, I must say, though we often think of it as a future thing, is something that we look forward to for the future, and certainly we do. Certainly we do. But it has great implication on how we live our lives now. Thus far, Paul's line of reasoning has been that there must be a bodily resurrection. There has to be. It's a non-negotiable of the faith. In fact, it seemed that there were some Corinthians who were questioning whether there had been a bodily resurrection or whether there would be a bodily resurrection or not. So Paul had to address it. And this was his line of reasoning. First of all, he said, there was the resurrection of Christ. That there had to be a resurrection of Christ. And because there was a resurrection of Christ, there would be a bodily resurrection one day. But if there was no bodily resurrection one day, then in fact there wasn't even the resurrection of Christ. And if there wasn't the resurrection of Christ, then in fact we have no faith, we have no hope, we have no future. And that was his beginning and his line of reasoning. That it was the resurrection of Christ that established the principle for what one day would be our bodily resurrection. And if there is no bodily resurrection of saints, then there in fact was no resurrection of Christ and we have no faith period. We're all, it's, it's hopeless. Sell the buildings, move away, quit meeting for church because we're wasting our time if there is no bodily resurrection. That's how important this doctrine is, folks. And I would dare say, if you're here today and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, as gently as I can put this, you have no part in this. You just, you just don't. Not now. But if you were to confess your sin and turn to Christ and receive Him as your Savior, repent and turn to Him. Acknowledge your sin before Christ. Confess that you know He died on the cross for you and you know that salvation is not of your own, that it's only of Christ and receive His forgiveness based upon the, the debt He paid uh, for his blood, by, through His blood sacrifice. If you were to receive that today, you would immediately be transported into a brand new life where you now have part in the bodily resurrection one day. But outside of Christ, you have no part in it. There, there are times where we gather at funerals 
And there have been times where I've been asked to preach funerals for, for people I did not know who, who maybe the, the funeral home has called me and said, hey, this, this individual passed away. They have no church. Uh, they have no pastor. Would you mind coming and, and preaching the funeral? And I've done that a number of times. And I do that uh, eagerly if I can because I, I know this. That if they have no church home, if they have no pastor, there's a very, very good chance that they're not saved. Now, I can't judge a person's heart, but I would say this. It's more likely that they're not saved if they have no church home, no pastor, no, no Christian friends, the, the whole deal. So I'll go into those situations preparing to share the gospel. And I usually say there's only one requirement I ask is that I'll be, able, that I'll be allowed to take the Scriptures and preach the Scriptures. If that's the case, then, then I'm fine. Anything else they want me to do, that's fine as long as I'm able to preach the gospel from the Scriptures. So I'll go into those situations, and oftentimes I'll hear someone say, well, you know, Pastor, I just want you to know, so no, did this, and their life was like this, but you know, now they're in a better place. And in the back of my mind, all I can think of is, you know what? Probably not. Pastor, that's, that's harsh. It, it is reality. I'm telling you here today, those who have breath in their bodies and life in their limbs who are here today, this is your opportunity to understand. If you leave this earth without having experienced the resurrected Christ in your life, you have no part in what I'm about to share. And I would be the, the most hateful preacher on earth if I did not warn you. And preachers who stand in pulpits who will not tell you, they might smile a lot, but they are hateful men if they will not tell you that. And so here we are looking at 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 50, the resurrection life. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 50, I'll read. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death shall be swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. As Paul finishes up this great resurrection chapter, he gives us one last calling, command, exhortation, not only to consider a couple of the, the ideas of the resurrection, but in the last verse of this chapter, he issues us an imperative that is a command. It, this passage, as much as any in this chapter, give us, uh, gives us walking papers. It, it lays out once again a couple of the details about the bodily resurrection and then finally issues forth in one final majestic call to live a life that is reflective of the, revela of the resurrection. So this morning we'll begin thinking about, thinking about the resurrection life by explaining the bodily resurrection in verses 50 uh, through 57. Explaining the bodily resurrection. Paul says, Now... This I say, brethren. And so just reiterating this idea when he says brethren, generally speaking, he's, he's talking to Christians. Now Paul understands that even though he's speaking to a, a, a church and the, though he's speaking primarily to Christians, there will be unbelievers in that group. Just like in 1 John, John said that there were those who left the church and they were never part of the church. And if they if they'd been part of the church, they never would have left it. So, so Paul understands, Peter understands, all the writers uh, of the Scriptures of the New Testament understand that even though you're speaking to a group of Christians, there are probably going to be those who are unbelievers among them, but the message by and large is to believers. So he says, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Here's a very important truth to learn about the resurrection. If you are simply flesh and blood and you have never experienced a supernatural transformation 
you not only will you not experience the resurrection, you cannot experience the resurrection. You have need of the resurrection to even be able to experience the eternal. Nor does corruption uh, inherit in corruption. When uh, in 1969, when NASA and our space program landed on the moon, it was an incredible event. My (laughs) great-grandmother, Mamaw Kate, uh, to her dying days, she still believed they had set that thing up in some Hollywood studio somewhere. She was convinced of it. (laughs) I think she went to her grave believing that that thing wasn't real, the, the moon landing. Nevertheless, some of you have seen the pictures, some of you who are alive at the time, and those who have studied it, recall the, the space suits that they wore. The, the space suits that allowed them to get out of the ship and walk on the moon. And in the space suit, all that it had with it, the weight and the breathing apparatus, it was absolutely impossible for a human being to step out of the spaceship, walk on the moon, simply in our mortal bodies. It would be dead within seconds. There are certain places where the human body is incapable of experiencing life. There are certain conditions where this human body is incapable of experiencing life. One of those places is in the uh, incorruptible, in the eternal, in, in, in the afterlife. This human body is incapable of living life beyond this earth. Now, this human body is set up pretty good for this earth, for the most part. The older it gets, the less suitable it is for this earth. Some of you can say amen to that, right? The longer we go, it seems the less suitable these bodies are for this earth. They just kind of start wearing down. <laughs> but still... These human bodies are just right. They they take in just the right amount of oxygen, put out just the right amount of carbon dioxide, the blood flow, the whole thing. This atmosphere on earth is perfect for these human bodies. God built it to be that way. But beyond this earth, well, that's an entirely different story. Whether it's the moon or Saturn or Neptune or Mars or whether it is the afterlife, your human body is incapable of experiencing the resurrection life. So what will we do, Pastor? Well, we need a new body. Well, Pastor, how do we get that? Well, we get it because Christ gives it to us. Well, how does He give it to us? He gives it to us when we receive Him as, as our Savior, when He comes into our life. On this earth, Jesus Christ lives in my body, and after this earth, I will gain a new resurrection body one day, given to me by God Himself, paid for by the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so this body is incapable of experiencing resurrection apart from Christ. And so he says, Behold now, I'm going to to explain something to you. We shall not all sleep, that is, die. And throughout the New Testament, that term uh, sleep is used to refer to those believers who have died, which I I love that idea. You know, for a Christian, dying is like simply closing my eyes and and opening them up in in a new life. It's a beautiful scene. Let me reiterate, that is not true. For the unbeliever. In fact, for the unbeliever, might I just suggest to you that when they open their eyes after death, it's, it is the most horrible thing that they will ever experience, that they've ever experienced. And it is an awful thing to consider and an awful thing to think about. That an unbeliever will close their eyes only to wake up to that which we cannot even begin to comprehend in terms of horror and pain and suffering. The Bible gives us some explanation of it. The, the rich man and Lazarus in the book of Luke But I would dare say the Bible can probably only begin to give us some idea of what the lost will experience when they wake up after they die, so to speak. But for the believer, for the Christian, it's a much different thing. When we die, we go to sleep. And we don't wake up with nightmares. We wake up with mighty good dreams. And not just dreams, but reality. And so Paul says here, I'm going to tell you something that that is hard to comprehend. It's a mystery. That is the Greek word mousterion. Uh, And it was a word that oftentimes referred to to that that which is available to those who have been initiated into it. Christians, we we are the initiated. We actually have some access to this. And even still, it's somewhat of a mystery to us. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That is, leave this earth. But we will all be changed. Good news. Some of us will experience bodily resurrection without ever having experienced death on this earth. Some not. Now, many have gone before us. You know, many of you have loved ones who have passed on. And they went to sleep. 
Paul says there, there will be some who will still be alive on earth when the end times take place, when Christ returns, the resurrection takes place, the bodily resurrection, when Christ returns to earth, and, and they will not have died from this earth. Will that be us? Will, will that be a, a future generation? God knows the timing. I just know this. There will be Christians still alive when the bodily resurrection takes place. But in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. That's pretty quick. Second Peter describes it as, as being like a thief in the night. We talked about this in my Sunday school class this morning. And we, we shared, how many of you have ever had the unfortunate, awful experience of having had someone break into your homes and steal things out of your home? Uh, hope, prayerfully, when you're not there, I see some hands. A number of you, yeah. And, and, I, and we were in Sunday school this morning. I said, well, here, here's the question. Um, the, the day before, did, did that particular criminal, whoever it was that broke into your home, did they show up? Uh, yeah, uh, M- Mr. Herb, we're going to beat your house about, about 3 o'clock tomorrow. We're going to steal your TV, eh, probably your VCR too, your wife's jewelry. Um, if you have any cash laying around, we can find it. We'll probably steal that too. We just want to let you know we'll be by tomorrow about 3 o'clock. Thank you and leave. Well, they didn't do that, did they? They don't do that. What happens? They, they want to make sure, a criminal wants to make sure you're not there. They want to get in, get out, and you don't even know what's happened until it's over. Well, according to Second Peter, that is what the coming of Christ will be like. That is what the end times, the bodily resurrection, all the events that are reflected in the end times, and particularly in this case we're talking about the bodily resurrection, will happen, boom, just like that. It says in a moment, this word moment, this word moment here, in, in It is a Greek word which refers to the smallest division of time possibly imaginable, which in those days was not as small of a division of time as we can even measure today. Where where even today with our scientific technology, you can measure nanoseconds. Whatever the smallest division of time is that you can possibly imagine, that's how quick all this will happen. It's not going to be a a thing where you go through phases. It's not going to be like pre-op. I never understood pre-op being like four days before the surgery. Pre-operation. I always thought that was right before the operation. But apparently it's days before the operation. But it's not going to be like that. These resurrection bodies, it'll happen in a moment. The smallest division of time you can possibly imagine, it'll be quicker than that. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. And he gives us a little bit of an order here. The trumpet will sound. And the dead will be raised incorruptible. We've already learned that earlier in the chapter, that those who have passed on get to go first. I guess it's because uh, they, they went on first and they get some benefit of going first. They get to, to go up and be resurrected first, but that's okay because we will be and I will be uh, right behind them. Or may, maybe I'll be one who will go first. Maybe I've passed on. Who knows? The trumpet will sound, verse 52, and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. What a beautiful sound. Paul is essentially summarizing all that he's described already in the first 49 verses of 1 Corinthians 15. There is this order that will take place and we will be changed. In fact, he says in verse 53, for this corruptible, this body, it must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. Listen, it is not that it is a good idea. Your body must put on immortality if it's ever to experience eternity that your body cannot handle eternality in a finite body it is the the space shuttle that leaves the earth and those tiles on the outside that we always hear about and most of the time that we've had space accidents it's been about those tiles being cracked and the ship burning up going through the ozone layer and exploding and that kind of thing the ozone layer is so hot and so intense it would be we would be incinerated going through it if we didn't have protection. Well, in the very same way, we cannot go into incorruptibility with corruptible bodies. We must be changed. We will be changed if we are in Christ. So this is an explanation of the resurrection. He goes on, verse 55. Excuse me, verse 54. So when this this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, at that point, when my body is resurrected then at that point, all the prophecies that have been, that have been spoken regarding the resurrection will, will be wrapped up. 
They shall be brought to, brought to pass saying that it is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. A, a, a prophecy out of Isaiah. Death will be swallowed up in victory. Yes, when Christ died on the cross and when He was resurrected, He defeated death. And then one day, when we experience our resurrection bodies, we will wrap up the prophecy to tie kind of a neat bow on the end. It'll all be done. What was already accomplished, folks, it's as good as done. It's just uh, chronologically, it was not yet happened. And so one day it will. And when that happens, all of it will be wrapped up. And in verse 55, he says, We'll be saying, oh, death, where is your sting? Almost mockingly at death. Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Prophecies out of Hosea in the Old Testament. Almost mockingly, we will be able to say in our resurrected bodies, thumb our noses at death, you don't have any grip on me anymore. And it will happen one day. Listen, folks, it's as good as happened. It's not It's not if it will happen, but when it will happen. What Christ says about the bodily resurrection is not something that is in the future, and so it's a good chance that it will happen. It's as good as happened. We just haven't gotten there chronologically yet. By the way, Christ is already there because He transcends time. When one day we will experience that, it will wrap everything up. We'll be able to thumb our noses at death. In verse 56, the sting of death, He explains. The problem... With death, for the average person, is sin. And if we leave this earth without ever having dealt with our sin, that's where the problem is. He said the sting of death is sin. Leaving this, the only problem with leaving this earth is when you do it without Christ. Because you do it without ever having your sins dealt with. And if you leave this earth, if you leave this life without ever having had your sins dealt with, that is where the problem comes. That's the pain, that's the sting, that's the death. Paul wrote in Romans, the wages of sin. What you get paid for your sin is death. If you do a job, you work 10 hours, you're getting paid $10 an hour, then your wage is $100. You're getting paid for what you did. If you leave this world trying to pay for your own sin, you will pay for it with death, eternal death. If you allow Christ to pay for it, that's an entirely different prospect. And so the thing that makes death so bad is not death in and of itself. It's the sin that has not been dealt with when I leave this earth. But praise God, in June of 1988, by God's grace, not because, of, because I'm smart or because I'm spiritual, because of God's grace, He came in and dealt with my sin. And so I will leave this earth without the sting of death. I, am, I praise God for that. And it makes me nothing more special uh, than a lost person walking outside because the only, thing, the only reason that I'm saved is because of God's grace and not because of me. And so the sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin, this is it's just an interesting statement. The strength of sin, it's the law. Paul said, look, you wouldn't even know what sin was except for the law. You, you, you try to obey the law, and you, you fall shorter and shorter and shorter. The strength of sin, he says, is the law itself. You would not have even known what sin was except for the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who gives us the capacity to leave this earth without the sting, without the desperation, without the pain of death. It is through Jesus Christ that we can leave this earth simply falling asleep. This is the bodily resurrection. One day it will be something very, very different than we experience now. I remember years ago, uh, in 1997, Alyssa and I were, were about to build a house. And it was the subdivision where we were building was in a, in a peach orchard. And so we, we walked out to the lot that we had chosen that we'd purchased and we walked that lot back and forth and we already knew the house that we wanted to build we found the plan and it was kind of our sort of kind of our dream house at the time and we walked that lot and I gotta tell you it was hard for me to picture that house sitting on that lot with peach trees and weeds growing it was just, it was hard for me to picture and, and then they cleared the lot left a few peach trees across the back Never grew many peaches on it, by the way. I'm not much of a peach farmer, I suppose. Anyway, we cleared, cleared the lot, and they laid out the, the foundation. 
And I remember when the, the pouring boards, you know, where you're going to pour the concrete on the foundation were laid out. And they had laid the strings out for all that. I went and stood in the middle of what would be my house. And it was still hard for me to picture that house sitting there. I just, I have a hard time envisioning stuff like that. Some of you are very gifted and you can, you can envision something before it happens. This, this sanctuary, for instance, this sanctuary, I've had many people come in and say, well, this is one of the most beautiful sanctuaries I've been in. Well, we had some folks who were on our, 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 our building team at the time, uh, our building committee, who could envision colors and designs and decorations and they can envision it before it went out and they would know that it would look good and not me. I'm just, I don't, I don't I'm not really able to do that. I don't think so. I'm standing on the, in the middle of my, my house. It's not my house. It's just a pouring boards laid out for my foundation, and I can't envision it. And finally, one day, months later, the house was built, and it was standing there, and I had pictures of the lot before the house was built, and, of course, pictures once the house was built, and it was an entirely different entity. What it was the day I walked the weeds and the peach trees was something entirely different when it was finished. In a very real way, for us to try to imagine these bodies in the resurrection form might be a little futile because it's going to be something very, very different. In fact, different than I think we can even imagine. I believe we do get some glimpses, some of those. Maybe as we see Jesus walking in His resurrected body uh, when He came back, He resurrected and He came back to walk the earth before He ascended to the Father. I think there are some things we can learn from that, but far, far from all of them, these bodies are going to be quite, quite different. And so... That's what we have to look forward to one day, Christians. So, Pastor Johnny, is that all? Is that it? Just something to look forward to? Well, let me share with you a few thoughts about how you ought to live your lives now and impact you every day because you have the prospect of a bodily resurrection. Look at verse 58. Paul issues forth three imperatives, three commands to us that are tied to the bodily resurrection. Do you see the first word of verse 58? Therefore, all that he's just said, in fact, we, we, could, very, we could very well tie therefore to the entire chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. All that I've just said, Paul says, about the resurrection, the resurrection of Christ, the coming resurrection, the order of the resurrection, the body, and all the order that will take place, out of all that, Here's what we need to take away from it because you understand there has to be a point where when you study Scripture, you say kind of the, so what, (laughs) right? All these things are great. The doctrine of resurrection, the theology, all of it's great. But at some point, there has to be this place where we say, but so what? If you never take Scripture beyond the theory, if Scripture never lives in your life beyond the abstract, then all you have is information. But what we want is the Holy Spirit to take Scripture in our lives and take the doctrine and the theology and the rich truths of God's eternal Word and transform them into practical actions in our lives. To transform them from the abstract to the concrete. From the revelation to the walking out. From the the spiritual to the shoe leather, if you will. And so here it is. First of all, Paul says, Therefore, because of all this idea about the resurrection and the bodily resurrection, my beloved brethren, first, be steadfast. Or be firm. Stand firm. It means to be fixed in a place. To be fixed in a place. I I get the idea here of moving forward without flinching. My, my perspective on this is, is the offensive God's given us. The offensive. Be firm. Uh, the, because of the bodily resurrection, I can move forward in life and not have to be scared of what might happen to me. Because here's the thing. The worst you can do to me is kill me. And guess what? I'm going, to have a, I'm going to be with Jesus and have a bodily resurrection. So the worst you can possibly do to me is actually what's going to be the best for me one day. So what if you leave me on this earth? Well, Paul said, uh, if you persecute me, then quite frankly, the persecution of this earth is not not even worthy to be compared to what will happen one day, the bodily resurrection. 
the, the badness of this earth is not even in the same universe as the goodness of what will be. The badness is far less bad than the goodness is good. And so we can walk through life now knowing that even though I'm experiencing bad things, it's only a small bad compared to the great good, the magnificent good, the eternal good that will be for my life one day. It allows me to walk through the crucible knowing that I'm bulletproof. I, I would dare say if I went out into a battle with just what I'm wearing now, I, I would be a little skittish. But if I went out into a battle with a helmet and, and, and bulletproof armor all over my body, knowing that it, it is not possible to pierce that armor, knowing that I could, I'm going into a, a military battle, a gunfight, and it is, it is impossible to pierce uh, the armor I'm wearing with any bullets or any explosions or any bombs, that would give me a much greater confidence, would it not? And so as I walk through this earth, the confidence I have as a Christian is this. I can be firm. I can stand firm. I, I can be steadfast. Here's why. I'm bulletproof. <laughs> Pastor Johnny, someone can shoot you with a gun and it would kill you. Well, no, it just put me to sleep and I'd wake up with a new body. Now, I'm not asking somebody to shoot me. I don't prefer that. But I'm just saying. Uh, <clears throat> earlier this year, Sweet Pea uh, did her first year of coach pitch softball. You know, now the coach is pitching to you, are not hitting off the tee anymore. It's coach pitch softball. And so we began to work with her, you know, throwing the softball to her. And, and it's kind of that when they first start learning, it's like kind of back away from trying to catch it because there's this fear of hitting them in the face. And the more you throw it to them, they get a little more comfortable. But uh, and one of the things about, about girls softball is it's played on a smaller field, even the older ones. It's a very fast game. I love to watch right now the, the ladies' uh, softball College World Series is going on. I love to watch it. It's such a fast game. It's played on a smaller field. The bases are closer. Everything happens quick. And a lot of the girls, especially the younger girls, wear these, these masks, like a, almost like the catcher's masks we used to wear, but they wear them in the infield now, which I prefer. It's a much safer thing because they're standing so close to the batters who, who hit the ball. So we, we got Sweet Pea one of those masks to, to wear in the field that all the other girls wore too. You know something I noticed? As soon as she got that mask and I began to throw to her, she was much less timid about catching the ball. It, she, she would catch it much more easily. And I determined that she now realized, even if the ball hit her in the face, it could not hurt her. It couldn't hurt her. Why? Because she had this mask on. Listen, folks, if we walk through life going, you know what? No matter what happens, you can't hurt me. Whatever you do to me, ultimately, I'm going to be resurrected one day. You can't touch me. That should affect how we live every day. My favorite Superman was Christopher Reeve. That was when Margot Kidder played Lois Lane. I remember some of the scenes in some of those Superman movies, one, two, and three. You go back and look at some of those old Superman movies and you look at the graphics and it's almost laughable because of the graphics that are available today and the technology. But back then we thought it was great. <laughs> but you'd see him walk, walk into situations where people were shooting guns, shooting bullets at him. They'd bounce off. The confidence that Superman walks into a gunfight. The bullets cannot pierce him. Who wouldn't be confident in that case, right? That is us as believers spiritually. It's us walking through a gunfight knowing whatever happens, I'm going to be okay. There's a spiritual battle happening every day in our lives and we should be steadfast. Stop being scared. Stop being timid of the health. Stop being timid of the finances. Stop being timid of the relationship. Stop running away and being scared. Figure out this, that one day you will have a bodily resurrection and that impacts today because this world can't hurt you because of the bodily resurrection. So be firm, the offensive. And then Paul says, Be steadfast, be immovable. Immovable. Let nothing move you. Not to be moved away, literally. This is the defensive. This is, I'm going to root myself here, I'm going to plant myself here, and I ain't moving. This is where I stand. I couldn't help but think of the, the story of the Alamo. Remember the Alamo? It lasted back from early February into March in 1836 with Sam Bowie in charge, Davy Crockett among the 
soldiers there. About 300 ended up, when the, when the battle, battle finally hit, about 300 were in the Alamo. General Santa Ana came up from Mexico and he actually attacked the Alamo, which was a mission, a Spanish mission. It wasn't even intended to be a fort. He attacked it with about 1,500 soldiers, about five times the number in the Alamo. It took three attacks to finally overwhelm. Now, I thought about that. Five times the number of soldiers makes you wonder, why, why didn't they overwhelm that, that the Alamo in the first attack? If you've got five times as many soldiers as are in that, that little structure, how could you not overwhelm it? Why would it take three charges, three attacks? And the only conclusion I could come to was because they were in a defensive posture. Now, I realize some of you are saying, but Pastor Johnny, they got destroyed. Yes, they did. And so that's where the illustration kind of breaks down. But the point is they were in a defensive position, immovable. And they were able to withstand a much greater force for a long time because they were in a strong defensive position. Back in World War I, any of you who have studied World War I know that it was by and large, or in many cases over in Europe, a, it was trench warfare. It was nasty, awful it was an awful war. Big trenches were, were built across battlefields that when it rained would, would uh, suck horses down into the mud three, four feet deep. It was nasty warfare. and You could lose a thousand soldiers gaining 50 feet of ground. But they built those trenches in, in a defensive position. You could not move people out. Now, maybe you couldn't charge in that case, but you couldn't be moved out either in those trenches because it was such a strong defensive position. You hear stories about much smaller forces holding off much larger forces because they have a, a mountainous position that larger forces have to, to run up uh, toward. In the Battle of Gettysburg, some, some of those charges that the Confederate soldiers made up hills, especially Little Round Top, and those, but a big part of that was they were in the, the Union Army was in such a strong defensive position. Well, we have that as believers. We are in a strong defensive position. We don't need to be moved. Don't let the enemy dupe you into thinking you've got to back off or back up or fall down or run away. What he wants to do is scare you so badly with illusion, making you think he can hurt you when he really can't. And so we have Christians running because of an illusion. Listen, it says here in the Scriptures that we cannot be moved. If the enemy moves you, it's because you chose to move. He does not have the capacity to force you out. He's, he's giving you false ideas about what He's capable of doing to you. He cannot overwhelm you because Christ is in you. And He who is in you is greater than He who is in the world. Understand that because we have within us a power that is greater than that power coming down on top of us, He cannot move us. Now, we can move ourselves and we can run away. And we run away when we get the illusion that we're being overwhelmed. That's what we do as believers. Oftentimes people drift away from the church. People drift away from the faith because they think they're being overwhelmed and really it's just an illusion. The reality is what's in you is greater than he is coming down on top of you. So the only weapon he has is to fool you, to make you think he's more powerful than he is. Now, don't get me wrong. The enemy certainly is powerful. But understand something else. The Christ in us is much more so. So be immovable. That is our defensive posture. So be firm, offensive. Be immovable, defensive. And then Paul says this, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Be faithful, consistent. Always abounding. Always give yourselves. Be always abounding. In exceeding measure, being bound. Listen, the reason I don't stop serving the Lord is because I know that nothing I do is in vain. It says it right here in verse 58. Part of me knowing that, I'm resur that I'll be resurrected one day is being able to continue to serve and to work consistently without giving up. Can I ask you a question? How many of you... I didn't really give you a chance to answer that, did I? How many of you are serving in a place or have served in a place where in the back of your mind you're beginning to feel like maybe it is just futile? You see so little progress... You see so little movement forward, you're just beginning to wonder if it's making any impact at all. How many, I'm not asking you to raise your hands. I don't even want you to. I'm just, in the back of your minds, I want you to think about this. 
how many of you are serving somewhere? How many of you are raising children? How many of you are, are giving of your, your, your tithes and offerings? And in the back of your mind, you're beginning to wonder if it's really any use at all because you see so little progress. You share your faith with a hundred people and nobody gets converted. Am I just wasting my time? You, you, you show up to serve in Awana for 156 times and you just don't see the progress you'd like. Am I just wasting my time? I give him my offering again and again and again, and, I, and I'm just not seeing any progress financial. I'm just not seeing any spiritual blessings like I thought I would. Am I just wasting my time? Paul says that the bodily resurrection and the guarantee of it, one of the things it does for us is it allows us to be, it allows us to be steadfast. It allows us to be continually abounding. It allows us not to give up. Because no, ba- no matter how difficult things might seem at the moment, here's one thing I know. I will be resurrected one day, and so nothing I'm doing now is in vain. Nothing, I'm, nothing, not a cold cup of water given in the name of Jesus is in vain. Not a single one. Not a tract that you hand out is in vain. Not a ministry that you serve to a child who seems not to care a thing in the world is in vain. Not, not a help you give to someone in the nursing home who there seems to be no, no response there at all is in vain. Not a sermon you hear, not a Bible study you do, not a thing you do is in vain. How do I know that, Paul? Because of the guarantee of the resurrection. That's how important it is. And so I'm just wondering today, <clears throat> how many of you are sitting out there and, and either you don't have a part in this, You've realized this morning you don't have a part in the resurrection because you've never experienced the resurrection of Christ in your life personally by confessing your sin and turning to Him. In just a moment, in fact, I'm going to have the praise team come on up. 